Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. We're here today with Richard Mendel, beekeeper and educator. For the past several years, Richard and beekeepers around the world have been watching as bee populations have declined, while mites and viruses that prey on bees have been increasing. Scientists speculate that many variables, such as poor nutrition and pesticides, may be making the bees more vulnerable to these problems. Today we're going to narrow our focus to the issue of pesticides and what we as homeowners can do about bee decline. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. We're really glad you could be here. Glad to be here myself. You're a beekeeper and you teach people about bees and your email address includes the words bee rescue. Can you address what that's all about? Well, I, I actually had a gentleman say, that's a strange name, Brescue. And I said, well, actually, <laughs> it's B and the word rescue. <laughs> and it, it's what uh, myself and the other beekeepers are trying to do is rescue bees that are in trees that are being chopped down, or homes that are being dismantled, or just uh, swarms that are wild. Hmm. Well, it sounds like you know a whole lot about bees. So I'd like to show you a movie that we produced a couple years ago and get your thoughts on some of what it covers. We're going to show the intro and then skip to this section on pesticides. It's called the Pollinator Pyramid. One third of the food we eat would not exist if it were not for the tireless work of millions of native pollinators and non-native honeybees. In addition to pollinating our fruits, nuts, and vegetables, bees also pollinate the alfalfa we need to produce our meat, wool, and dairy products. Bees, there's no food, and without food, there's kind of no us. Pollinators are essential to the health of our economy and to the health of our planet. But beekeepers around the world have witnessed an alarming phenomenon. Roughly 400 beehives that are totally empty. The bees were all gone. They're gone. I mean, where'd they go? They'll know. Since Hackenberg made his discovery, a third of the honeybees in the country have either died off or disappeared. And the acreage that needs pollinating is increasing dramatically. So there's going to be very quickly a need for many more colonies of honeybees, and it's not going to happen. I mean, it, we're seeing this struggle by the beekeepers to just keep up with the numbers of colonies that they have. And believe me, there are not a lot of people standing in line to become beekeepers. And to make matters worse, it's not just the honeybee that is at risk. Pollinators in general in North America are in decline. Wild pollinators help pollinate our crops and our native plants as well. Their great biodiversity forms the building blocks, the matrix upon which our ecosystems depend. 3,500 species of bees other than honeybees here in the United States that are our native pollinators. Alarmed at these declines, scientists are working hard to find a cause. The consensus is that a variety of factors are working together against pollinators, including the escalating trends of habitat loss and pesticide use. As homeowners, what can we do to make our yards healthier for pollinators so they can continue their vital work which sustains our world? creating habitat, using alternatives to pesticides, and combating our tendency towards insectophobia will allow the pollinator pyramid to provide the stable base upon which we all depend. One of the problems of using insecticide is that while you may be targeting on the detrimental insect, you may be killing a lot of the of the natural pollinators which you want. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, homeowners use up to 10 times more chemical pesticides per acre on their lawns than farmers use on crops. So if, if that's the case, why, you know, there's a big place we can start to cut back on the usage. David Hackenberg has been speaking out about the possible connection between bee losses and pesticides because from his work as a traveling beekeeper, the two seem to be correlated. Pretty evident when you start talking to beekeepers here in the United States and even around the world that as long as you aren't around places where these chemicals are being used, the bees seem to be fairly healthy. Researchers also are concerned about the effect of pesticides. 
Penn State University researcher Marianne Frazier, a lead scientist in the Colony Collapse Disorder Working Group, is investigating the effects of pesticides on bees. Her team is analyzing hives for the presence of chemicals. The 118 that we've actually analyzed quite closely, we have found all but three of those samples have been positive for uh, some pesticides. On average, we've found five to six pesticides per sample, and it, as many as 17 pesticides in one sample of pollen from one beehive. Scientists are not only concerned with the level of pesticides, but the mix, because sometimes different chemicals can work together to be far more dangerous than when they act alone. As many as 10 or 100 or 1,000 times more toxic. And as they gather this pollen to take it home to feed it to their young, uh, this pollen is laced with these chemicals and all these blends are going back to, back to the colony, whether it's a honeybee colony or other insects, and being fed to their young. We think the pesticides are acting at the sublethal level, so that they're doing things to the bees, not killing them outright, but potentially leading to their death. We know that the pesticides can interfere with the ability of bees, honeybees, to learn. That could account for why bees maybe can't find their way back home. They fly out and they don't come back. Pesticides, we know, can impair the immune system of non-target insects, like pollinators. A lowered immune system could make bees more susceptible to pathogens, such as the acute Israeli paralysis virus, which made headlines in 2007 as a possible cause of colony collapse disorder. Our big question is, is that what's happening? Is the immune system of the bees being compromised? And then these diseases have the opportunity to be much more deadly to the, to the bees. There are various ways that chemicals can reach the pollinators that share our yards. For instance, when they visit blooms that have been directly treated or blooms that are near where chemicals have been used. Even though you may not be spraying plants in your garden, for instance, that are blooming, there could be drift to the blooming plants. And even applying chemicals after dusk when bees have gone home for the night is not a guarantee. If the pesticide has been sprayed on a blooming plant, the next morning the bees come in contact with those pesticides and we can see a real problem. It is also possible that liquid pesticides applied to a plant's roots can eventually reach bees. It was thought that these things were okay for pollinators because it's unlikely that the pollinators are going to come in contact with them because of the way they're applied. But because they're systemic and they're taken up into the plant, it can move into the pollen and nectar. Can it reach the bees? We have used homeowner type products on crab apple trees. And sure enough, we found high enough levels that we were concerned about the pesticide in that pollen, yes. And contrary to assumptions, time may not lessen the risk. And sometimes even in the following year, we see higher levels of the pesticide than we did the year before. A chemical-free world is impossible. You know, we got to have some chemicals, I understand that, but... Do we really need all that we think we need? Do you put any spray on your berries? Absolutely not. No need. Why do you think other people put sprays on blueberries? Just because maybe they're used to putting spray on everything. It's amazing how much pesticide is used without cause, for, for no good reason. Can we find safer ways of doing things? There is a world of knowledge readily available in the library and on the internet about gardening without chemicals. Lifelong farmer Dwight Carpenter switched to all organic methods a few years ago and it works for him. Some people find it hard to believe. I don't use any pesticides whatsoever and they say, well, you can't raise that way. And I said, well, here's my proof. Dwight uses beneficial insects to keep pests under control. Luckily, many beneficial insects are attracted to the same species that support bees. You can spot treat many pests with insecticidal soap, which is safe for nearby bees and pets and other creatures we care about. Even simply picking a bug off by hand instead of using a pesticide spray or powder goes a long way in keeping chemicals out of our environment. In the lawn, try corn gluten meal for weed control. And instead of applying a grub killer that is toxic to bees, raise the mower blade because Japanese beetle grubs like short grass. Ants, spiders, and ground beetles will kill 80% of your Japanese beetle eggs. Another concern is that some mosquito control methods may inadvertently harm pollinators. When it comes to bee safety, 
and it's better to uh, apply uh, a repellent to yourself than it is to fog your yard. And it's better to uh, look for areas where you have standing water or if you're collecting rainwater to cover the rain barrels to make sure that mosquitoes aren't able to get in there and breed. It's better to use something that's going to be a float in water that's going to affect the larvae instead of spraying of insecticide because that's going to kill all kinds of beneficial insects. Insect-eating birds and bats eat thousands of mosquitoes, and they can be encouraged to frequent our yards by installing birdhouses and bat houses. So there are lots of safer ways to control or deter mosquitoes and not affect bees. While controlling some insects like mosquitoes and invasives is essential, most of the insects in our world are beneficial to us. We're gonna pause there. Richard, let's talk about the um, pesticide issue because on some of our other segments we're going to be talking about um, habitat loss and that kind of thing. So in terms of the um, losses that beekeepers have been witnessing, I think it was about four years ago that David Hackenberg first noticed the bees uh, leaving his hives in Pennsylvania and it was a couple years before that in Europe that the beekeepers there were noticing the losses. Now what's it been like since then and uh, what are we experiencing in the local area? Uh, losses are not uh, decreasing. As a matter really? of fact, they're averaging around 30 percent. Uh, <clears throat> and if this does continue, uh, it's going to be very difficult to continue replacing bees at that rate. 30 percent a year? 30 percent a year, yes. Wow. And have you as a beekeeper had losses in your hives? Uh, I have not this year, uh, oh, but good. I do expect this spring we've had a very difficult, uh, we had a late dry summer. Uh, and then a, a winter came in like a lion, very cold, and the bees uh, did not have a lot of forage or a lot of honey put up. That is both in the wild and in our uh, hives that we keep. So I'm very concerned that come this spring we could be very surprised. Hmm. Another thing I'd like to mention in the beginning is uh, Marian Frazier in our movie mentions that uh, in the hives that they tested, both the healthy hives and the sick hives, they found pesticides in nearly all of them. And so I'm wondering, does that mean that honey is unsafe for humans to eat? No, it does not. Uh, the pesticides uh, are in the wax and the pollen, specifically the wax where it's very difficult for it to, to go away or get it out. Uh, the honey is not, for some reason or other, the bees, the way they process the nectars with their own enzymes, do not uh, transport any of the um, uh, pesticides or insecticides that we're seeing and agriculture is not found in the honey. Oh, well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, and Marianne Frazier also in our movie mentions the sublethal effects that pesticides may be having on bees. What is she referring to? Well, sublethal is, um, in, in the pesticide ratings, there's, there's an LD number, and it's a lethal dose number. Okay. And it's usually called LD50, how much of the chemical is needed to kill half of whatever you're trying to kill. Uh, Sublethally, you're not going to end up killing the bees in this case, but what will happen is other chemicals combined with, with uh, chemicals that are being added uh, will affect their ability to learn. It will affect their ability to come out of the hive and uh, negotiate where they are by looking at the sun and coming back. Mm. Their ability to come back and even tell the bees in the hive where the nectar and pollen sources are. Mm. Uh, their ability to raise their young. So it, it's not a direct they don't die directly, but indirectly it, it affects their ability to survive. And could it be having a different effect on, say, say they're testing to see whether the adults die, could they perhaps be missing the effect on the larva? Well, actually there was an EPA study just recently that that's exactly what happened. I don't recall what that particular insecticide was, and the result came back that it did not affect adult bees but the long-term effect is that it was actually killing the larva. Hmm. And it would seem that they would have to um, test these products over a great um, number of years, well, maybe even uh, many months. I, I doubt that most manufacturers really have the money to do long-term testing um, to see whether this stuff accumulates in the hive um, and could be having problems through that uh, route. Hmm. So. Well, you know, I, I think I know what you're asking, and I, one of the, some of the readings that I have done, because I'm very interested in this and trying to understand why we're losing our hives with the groups that we work with, uh, 
the EPA has got a situation that they call a conditional registration. And it's very disconcerting because the conditional registration means that they have not completed any long-term testing, and yet they're allowing the different chemicals mm -hmm. to be introduced to the marketplace on the condition that if they do find something wrong, they can be removed. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of using ourselves as the, the test case mm -hmm. guinea pigs. Wow. Um, yeah, and the synergistic effects uh, Marianne Fraser mentions in the movie in terms of the, all the different chemicals that are found in hives, there's many different ones that can be in each hive and, and having um, effects that can be very hard to test for because how can you sort out what is causing what? Um, uh, that, that has been a challenge, I think, even uh, for us as beekeepers, it's a challenge because we also have uh, different chemicals that we're using to try and fight the mites, which is, mm. of course, the, the biggest problem that we have. And I don't think anyone re is realizing some of the chemicals that are fine for our use, but if they're combined with other chemicals or insecticides found in the field, we really don't know what the result of that is. So those synergies, I'm sure, are happening. Unfortunately, I don't think anyone's performed any peer-reviewed studies for that. Mm -hmm probably really hard to tease out those effects. Um, the New York Times last year had a uh, article that they came out with, which was big news, where these researchers had found that there was what they thought was the solution to colony collapse disorder. They found that there were certain, a certain fungus and a certain virus in all of the sick hives that they tested. And they were um, really excited about this. Does this mean that pesticides are off the hook? Uh, no. Matter of fact, it's interesting that you brought that up because uh, within three or four days there was a follow-up article uh, questioning Dr. Jerry Bromancheck, who actually uh, was the key investigator in, uh, in that. He actually has a company called Bee Alert in which he's working with the U.S. Army to detect landmines by using honeybees. Wow. The interesting thing is um, the follow-up article uh, did some investigation and they found that Jerry Bromancheck also was receiving grants from Bear Crop Science. Hmm. And uh, it's kind of a, a snicker in the community that, gee, all of a sudden uh, insecticides uh, supplied by, say, Bear Crop Science aren't the reason why we're having bee issues. And unfortunately, they found that you know, the grants are being issued by them to hmm. his company. So. We question some of that science, and we would like to see it peer-reviewed also. And it seems like that no matter what they're finding, um, the pesticides could still be making the bees more vulnerable. Um, you know, even if it is, you know, it's good news that they're sort of isolating what different viruses and fun fungus might be in the hives. But still, I don't think that what Marion Fraser says in the movie is any less true, right? That uh, pesticides could be making them more vulnerable to these things. Right. Well, they definitely introduce, you know, we, I think we all agree, and I say we, other beekeepers, uh, globally agree that the bees are under tremendous stress. Mm -hmm. What we've not been able to do is find a silver bullet that is causing this s distress. And uh, even as we as humans, if we're fatigued, we're going to get a cold. In the case of the bees, they're susceptible to viruses that are introduced mm -hmm. by the mites. They're susceptible to other parasites. So uh, it, it's really a, an accumulation of many, many factors. It's not just, yeah, this is the reason why. But I think in the case of uh, Dr. Jerry Bromancheck, uh, for him to say pesticides have no place or, or cannot you know, be part of that uh, is a little suspect. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned that maybe beekeepers could apply fungicides to the hives because they had found this fungus in them. And I immediately thought, oh gosh, that's another chemical. Um, mm -hmm. What about organic beekeeping? Is that a viable option? Well, it, it is. Matter of fact, there's, uh, <coughs> there's a um, process called integrated pest management. Matter of fact, uh, many of the farmers are using that in their own agricultural practices. And integrated pest management is not using uh, the chemicals that we typically see used. Uh, it's, it's using uh, benign chemicals, such as uh, thymol, which is, comes from the, the thyme uh, plant. Hmm. Uh, oxalic acid or um, I'm trying to think of the other one which I can off the top of my head. The other, there's another process of uh, removing mites which like to be in the drone cells by actually putting comb in there where the drones will be, the drone egg will be laid in there and the mites will 
uh, find themselves in the drone comb, and then the drone comb will be removed before the mites actually hatch hmm. and destroyed. So that in itself is a process of integrated pest management that's hmm. not invasive. Is kind of a management, um, right. changing your process right. instead exactly. of and, and introducing Exactly, you know, and interrupting the, uh, the brood cycle so that, uh, so again, mites do not overtake the hive. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, they, uh, the beekeepers uh, protested. A lot of the countries removed these questionable products from the shelves. And uh, whereas here in the U.S., we haven't seen that kind of movement towards, you know, removing these uh, products. And why do you think is the difference? Well, I, I think, and this is my personal opinion, but I think, interestingly enough, we're not as sensitive to, um, to chemical problems uh, invading the, the agricultural base. Um, I know England, uh, Italy, uh, Slovenia, um, I think there's another, France, have actually uh, asked the chemical companies and then have outlawed some of the neonicotinoids, which are, are some of the basis of a, of a lot of the general chemicals used today. We, for some reason or other here in the States, are not that sensitive to it and have not taken that approach mm -hmm. such as they have in Europe. I hear that they embrace the precautionary principle more in Europe where it's uh, better to err on the side of caution even if you're not 100% sure, whereas um, instead of you know, letting the damage be done and then trying to fix it later. So mm -hmm. maybe that would be some of it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of labels, if I go into a store and I look thoroughly at a label and I don't see anything on it that says that it's bad for bees, can I be 100% sure that it's okay to use that? I would say not. Uh, there's an MSDS label that actually gives you more information. Unfortunately, a lot of the MSDS information is not available on the product labels. It, in many cases, it's pages and pages of information. But you can go out to the EPA uh, internet site and you can take the information. You can just put that product name in there, the shelf name of the product, and it'll tell you exactly to what extent that product can be used. And you might be quite surprised at what's not on the label on the shelf. Hmm. Um, the movie mentions that organic produce is a good thing for bees in terms of minimizing their exposure to uh, chemicals. So tell me, how do the plants um, that get chemicals, how do the bees come in contact with that? I know with spray it's pretty obvious how a bee would come in contact with that, but what are some of the other methods? Well, there, there's a process called guttation and uh, it, it, you know, we think that in, in many cases mercury has been put on seeds and this, now it's the neonicotinoids that are uh, on the seeds themselves. Hmm. Unfortunately, through this process... Why do they put uh, that on a seed? Well, as the seed becomes a seedling, mm -hmm. any of these sucking or chewing insects will then be killed off or even uh, any of the um, uh, insects that are in the ground before the seed sprouts or while it's sprouting will be killed if, uh, if those particular larvae mm -hmm. or insects try to attack the seed. So the unfortunate part is uh, once that plant grows, that chemical is still in the ground and it's taken up by the plant and then it shows up uh, on the plant leaves or the stoma as a liquid. Oh. And uh, this is the guttation process uh, happening and unfortunately the bees will take that in and it's a very lethal dose of the chemical that we thought was going to be in the ground. Wow. And it can get into the pollen too, right? Goes yes. up through the mm -hmm. roots and into the pollen too. Um, on products, you frequently see the advertisement long lasting. And I used to think, oh, well, that means I wouldn't have to apply as much. So maybe it's better for the environment. But I'm beginning to wonder whether that isn't a red flag for bees, the phrase long lasting, because uh, at Marian Frazier in the movie mentions that um, it can actually increase in concentration, some of these systemic chemicals over time. Didn't she say like the second, third right. year it could be right. higher? Right. I think uh, the issue there is, in, and we're concerned with it too, is, is we, you know, buy apples and, and any fruit that we're going to eat is the residuals. And you hear about insecticides, oh wow, those are bad for you. There's a lot of residuals there. And the residual means that, that the first rain, the chemical won't be washed off of the blossoms or off of the fruit or whatever that we're uh, eating. So <clears throat> this is exactly what happens. The residuals will stay either on the plant and then you know if there's a, a spraying process every three weeks, especially if you have fruit products, they 
they get a lot of chemicals sprayed on them because of the different issues that are going on with other pest insects. So uh, this residual effect is, it does get compounded. Even though there are very strict guidelines of how much to use, when to use it, you know, sometimes there's that thought, if a little is good, then more is better, mm. which obviously could be problematic. Hmm. And I know that grub control contains uh, imidacloprid and other neonicotinoids, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that uh, perhaps we, as Americans, could be pos uh, possibly overestimating the danger of some grub problems in our yard as opposed to the danger these chemicals could be having to bees and our um, food supply mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the pollination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm <coughs> wondering if um, perhaps the, well for instance in my own case we moved into a house like 17 years ago and there were some patches on the lawn and I thought oh I better treat it for grubs but I didn't get around to it and the next year the patches were gone my lawn was fine and it's been fine since and I heard since then that grubs are cyclic and that the supply is not going to be suddenly um, mm -hmm. you know exploding in your yard and mm -hmm. you're going to just mm -hmm. like kill mm -hmm. your grass mm -hmm. so perhaps mm -hmm. uh, that would be something that we would um, rethink a little bit. Well, that and actually, if you kept your grass higher, it would be the grubs, for some reason or other, love the sunlight. And um, if the grass is higher, they don't get the sunlight and they won't do as well. Hmm. But we like our grass shorter rather than longer. Hmm. Well, I want to tell you quickly about an issue that we had in our um, locality. There was a swarm of bees that landed on a soccer net, and there was a uh, parents, they killed them off immediately with insecticide. And meanwhile, there was a local beekeeper that s had lost um, part of her beehives. And when she found out about it, she was like, oh my gosh, those were my bees. I'm sure mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. If you just had let me know, mm -hmm. I would have come and rescued them because mm -hmm. I guess it's not that hard. And so could you just take us through the steps of what, it, um, what people should do when they see a swarm? Well, uh, typically if you see a swarm, it's about 30% of an existing hive that is moving on to find a new hive. Mm. The queen is in that swarm. She has gone with the, the swarm as they exited the hive. And while that hive is hanging from your tree or bicycle or soccer net, there are scout bees out looking for a new home. Oh. And in many cases, I've had a number of calls where I will, if I'm not able to, to get there right away, I'll just tell the person, look, there's a possibility that an hour from now, 15 minutes from now, Two hours from now, those bees could actually just be gone because they found a new home. So call me if they disappear. I had a case like that down on East Liberty Street, and I was at the 4-H fairgrounds. And by the time we got done with our stuff going on, the guy called. He says, you're right. They left. He says, that was a miracle. I says, yes, it was. <laughs> so. Well, let's give them the SEMBA website, the Southeast Michigan Beekeepers Association uh, website. It's sembabees.org because right. if they go there, they can find uh, different beekeepers that will come and rescue the bee swarm. And it's pretty easy. They put, pad it into a box and yep. then they can take it out of there. All right, well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, if you'd like to learn more about pollinator decline, go to ewashtenaw.org forward slash green room. There you'll find links to a world of information about this important issue. Thanks for joining us here in the green room.